Hey Steve, it's Ryan O'Donnell just talking uh, about maybe a time to shoot. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Here we go. Ooh. Don't you just love that sound? Wait for it. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, sweet. <sighs> Do you know what this is? There's a, there's a backstory. Let me start there. So I was denied getting into Steve Hayes' lab as a graduate PhD student. And rightfully so. I mean, I submitted an application that was just completely missing the psychological uh, section of the GRE. No, if you're gonna do that, just, just apply it all. My thought was like, eh, if it's strong enough, it'll work. Now, fast forward, and I'm really excited because I get to go on this adventure with you all. And I was able to still get a little bit through sneaking into his class at UNR and his canonical works. So about a month ago, I was in Norway visiting some, some of the faculty. Ingen Sandeker told me that she'd be in Reno for this seminar with David Sloan Wilson. He was here visiting. You know, I'm not formally part of UNR. So I'd wish I was there. I got a little bit sad, but I went on with my day. Now you see there is this awesome and really... Hey there, I'm heading down. Now there's this really nerdy contextual behavior science as evolution science listserv. So a bunch of people on there, just really great minds emailing, talking about how contextual behavioral science can fit and be situated under evolution science. So we're gonna talk about that with Steve today. Super stoked, here we go. Okay. All right, see you in a second. All right. Part of this channel is exploring the history and the current movements that are being made to try to resituate our field and get our voice heard in the natural sciences. So let's start with uh, that story that you've told and how it kind of is relevant today about Skinner's last words. So what were they? You know, the night uh, before Skinner died, he was finishing uh, the article uh, on the uh, Lifetime uh, Award that he won from the APA. And his final sentence was about the importance of variation selection to the practice of a behavior analysis. Uh, I view that as kind of the baton that's being passed forward the next morning uh, without another word being written, he passed away. And that is not a kind of a recent vision that he had. This is something that he spent a good part of his uh, professional life focusing on. And the reason was is that he saw that a behavioral perspective belongs in the natural sciences, but not in, it doesn't fit comfortably in the wing that is reductionistic and mechanistic. But there is a, a functional contextual perspective in the natural sciences that in which behavioral thinking nests beautifully, and that's evolution science, cast in a particular way. And so he wrote about the, you know, contingencies of, uh, genetic evolution, contingencies of survival, they call them, and about the contingencies of cultural evolution, and viewed operant behavior as variation of selection within the lifetime of the individual. Some of his key ideas on that were actually ridiculed at the time by biologists, even by evolutionary biologists, some of which was due to the very gene-centric uh, uh, field that uh, evolution had become after the grand synthesis and the discovery of DNA and so forth. But uh, it turns out uh, Fred was very forward looking and evolution science has changed. And it's changed in a way that not only could they welcome the ideas that Skinner had, now with some advancements both on evolution science and on behavioral science, not only could they welcome it, they're beginning to realize they need it because it turns out that environment and behavior is what drives even uh, speciation, that cells are systems for turning environment and behavior into biology. It isn't the case that simple genes make behavior happen. We now can map the whole genome. We know that's not right. And it is true, what Fred claimed, that 
that selection operates at the level of groups, not the level of individuals. Something that was uh, ridiculed uh, at the time, but has turned out to be so. And so with my colleague, uh, David Sloan Wilson, who was important in bringing that perspective back, over the last 10 years, we've been exploring how to turn that alliance into something that is productive and not simply a matter of including the behavioral perspective, but actually uh, accommodating it in such a way that what we've learned, and what we know, can empower what our evolutionary uh, colleagues have learned and what they know in a way that is mutually beneficial to both of us. And that is fulfilling the dream of the founder of Behaving Houses in a way that I think is profound, has a chance to change our perspective and our place in uh, natural science writ large. All right, so what specifically changed within Evo Science? Well, what changed that made an opening, but also began to realize there's a necessity of bringing us in, is to begin to recognize the multi-dimensional and multi-level nature of evolution. Variation and selective retention, uh, that is a little locked down. But it turns out that there are are multiple dimensions evolving concurrently. And for example, uh, it isn't just genes, it's epigenes. What we're doing right now, the conversation we're having right now is up and down regulating genes that you have. And some of the things in this conversation might be there, uh, you know, weeks, months from now. Some of those epigenetic patterns of regulation go across generations. If you're mother was part of the winter dutch cohort that almost starved to death during the second world war depending on where you were in your mama's belly it will produce not just a change in your biology but a change in your children's biology and various things like whether or not you're likely to develop obesity uh, you know whether or not you develop diabetes right now it has to do in part with what your grandfather was eating I mean, there's things like that that have open, opened up uh, a, a, a window in because what is regulating the epigenetic processes are environment and behavior. Now, I think we've realized, we've long realized that through niche construction and niche selection, you change uh, pressures. Uh, for example, if you're uh, digging around for little mollusks in the mud, uh, and if that's the big reinforcer for you and you've sort of uh, created a little niche for yourself there, well, then the suction pressure changes in which you might actually evolve a beak like the one that flamingos have, or even filtering systems inside the beak that are like whales filtering out crustaceans, these baleen-like structures that are in the flamingo's beak. What drove that was reinforcement and the capacity to pick that niche and sort of stay there. But there's one other piece in addition to sort of appreciating the role of environment behavior in these multiple ways. And that's this. Evolution science is not penetrating our culture. You, there are entire states that eliminate, by dictate, the queen of the theories of the entire life sciences and restrict it or even try to get it out of their classrooms altogether. Our country in the United States has greater ignorance about evolution than any other developed country in the world. And the reason, I believe, is people don't look to evolutionary principles for application. And we ran into that as behavior analysts when we started stepping forward, when Fred Skinner stepped forward and became the best known scientist on the planet, the pushback was, this is mind control, psychosurgery, and eugenics. In other words, the shadow of the Second World War and of these kind of crude ideas about purity of race and things like that actually interfered with our ability to get into culture until, our, until the public began to understand how important we could be to your children and others when things have, are happening that require an intervention. Well, that shift hasn't happened for evolution. Nobody thinking about evolution as to what I'm going to do about this policy. But what am I going to do about this and this economic problem we have? They should, but they're not doing it. And we, frankly, are the applied wing. We're the the lab, uh, the field site for evolutionary thinking. We're the variation and selection folks. 
And yeah, we're going to expand that. We're going to learn more about evolution. We've got to think about it in a more sophisticated way. We shouldn't just wave our hands at it because, you know, the evolution is happening at multiple dimensions and multiple time frames. And so we have things to learn. But we also have things to contribute. And if you're going to put any of that knowledge about how to mount uh, policies, principles, programs that are sensitive to issues of variation selection, you're going to need the behaviorists to know how to enter into systems and do that. So it's a mutual thing that we're doing here of helping evolution science become a more complete science with all the dimensions there, including this variation and selection with the lifetime of the individual. And putting these principles that are so powerful in the natural sciences and biology and understanding why our structure is like it is, putting them into the culture in a way that just normal people realize this is helpful to us. That'll break down the barriers. That'll put the folks, uh, I think, uh, into a different frame of mind when they hear evolutionary accounts. Uh, so it's a win-win. Okay, so a lot of the people that tune into this channel are behavior analysts or interested in this traditional uh, behavioral approach, sometimes from the ACBS uh, uh, camps as well. W where do they take this? Like, what are the, the so what's? Like, what can you actually do with this? You know, the, <clears throat> there are several sensitivities I think you can get just out of this volume. Uh, and it's not written as applied volume, it's written as a, a kind of a, uh, a coming together of the traditions, but uh, there are many things in it that are uh, directly related to application, some of them outside of a behavior analytic point of view, but yet very accessible to us because they think about things in this functional, contextual, natural science, monistic way. And so uh, some of the things I think that would come into to just the work that BCBAs do that would come by expanding things out. One, if you really think about variation, selection, and retention in context of the right dimension and level, those six terms really basically capture evolutionary thinking, what we need to keep track of. Uh, I'm just gonna walk through that and say, here's a few things I worry about. Uh, variation, I think sometimes we do things like overtrained or particular topography, missing the unit and realizing the variation is critical in order to maintain contextual flexibility in order for uh, smaller units to fit with larger units. And that's in our behavior theory, but sometimes you look at like, I'll give an example, you know, overtraining tacts to the point that the relational basis underneath tact training, which is the, the evolving this frame of coordination or similar to equivalence, if you will, if you're just training positive instances, no negative instances, and you're not bringing it under contextual control where it hits the edges, you're producing rigidity, not flexibility. And so you better be putting exclusion trials in there. You better be putting opposites in there and be mindful about uh, this kind of go, no go, but then this increasing contextual control. This is an example of regard to variation. With regard to selection, I think we think about it in terms of external reinforcers beyond the point at which that becomes fully predictive. When you have a mental age of two or three, yeah, think about it that way. But when you're talking about a mental age of five, six, seven, and beyond, verbal behavior is so powerfully involved in selecting that. And there's some evolutionarily established, I think, reinforcers there having to do things like belonging in the group or uh, this uh, quality of, I'll even say, self-determination you know, the, of having some degree of independence, you know, of what's important for me. You know, I think sometimes we ride over that. You know, we don't ask people what they really want. We don't bring them in. We we're say we're supposed to, but you know, we're in there with our point system or our whatever. And, and sometimes I think in a way that doesn't fully uh, do justice to where reinforcement would take you uh, once you bring in uh, this uh, the symbolic relations that the relational operants uh, uh, give us. Um, if you think about it in terms of multidimensionality, you know, uh, just cognition itself, getting comfortable with that. You know, people know the song I'm going to sing. I mean, RFT helps you do that. I think the field is waking up to how profoundly that's true. And, you know, that's going to change a lot of our thinking. But the other thing it does is language partitions behavior. It starts breaking it up. We evolve 
Fred talked about this with his uh, paper on the evolution of cognitive language. We evolve ways of talking about thoughts, feelings, memories, and bodily sensations. We talk about them as if they're distinct. We evaluate them. If I say sad, you're going to think bad. If I say happy, you're going to think good. I mean, it's just sort of, and all of those things uh, are essentially creating dimensions we need to be mindful of, that we need to, for example, I think, look at dimensions that we're used to sweeping away before language and cognition comes in, like emotional responding, like uh, motivation, like attention, because there are uh, ways of speaking about how multidimensionality works once you get this evolutionarily recent adaptation of relational uh, operants into the room. Uh, another one might be a multidimensionality. There's no reason why we shouldn't be moving towards actually looking at the epigenetic changes that we're producing with our training programs. We know some of the epigenetic things that are central to helping people, for example, be less um, uh, emotionally shut down or less stressed uh, or uh, uh, other ones that we may find as we really dig in. Genetic moderators, you know, I think we're headed towards a time, not, it's not genes, it's entire gene systems, but you can begin to see some uh, fittedness of the things that we're doing in terms of the uh, basic underlying genetic uh, nature of the people that we're working with and in a full multidimensional count. Wouldn't we want that? Wouldn't you want to know if there was, uh, uh, for example, uh, a, a built-in tendency to respond over a, a longer period of time to aversives. I think there's a genetic loading there, mm -hmm. or be beginning, or, or built-in sensitivity to uh, aloneness and uh, uh, social disconnection. You know, we can identify gene systems that are like that, then would change how we approach that child or that person, that parent, that person we're working with. Now, some of that's out in the future, of course, but. I'm just saying, for us to be seen as part of a fabric of functional contextual thinking gives us immediate benefits right now. How to, you know, move these things forward. I, I didn't mention level, I kind of mentioned that because how do we nest what we're doing with the individual into the social structure, you know, and the organizational behavior management folks and folks interested in cultural development. The very work that you're doing, you're trying to do work in dissemination and changing things at a community level. Some of those require ways of thinking that evolutionists have done a lot of work on in cultural evolution and that we can find important ways of marrying up. We're doing an applied program right now. We being uh, David Sloan Wilson, myself, and my colleague Paul Atkins and other colleagues have taken Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning design principles for how groups work uh, to uh, protect their common pool resources and combining them are principles from acceptance and commitment training and, and producing a, a, a program for fostering pro-social groups of all levels and kinds. And uh, we have a book coming out on it, but we're also now com combining that. For example, I hope it doesn't sound like commercial, but in March, we're gonna be doing a boot camp for behavior analysts here in Reno again. And David Sloan Wilson is coming out for day four, and we're going to just go right into pro social. We're going to do a full day on OBM and pro social, mashing up these uh, design principles, which make perfect sense from the evolutionary point of view, for which uh, Lynn Ostrom won the Nobel with uh, products of behavior analytic thinking in the form of RFT and ACT. Uh, so that's our future, I think. Those are the bridges when built that allow us to play on the stage of natural science. Not just look at me, look at me, no, but actually being part of a genuine team that's uh, uh, together working to change the world by this functional, contextual, monistic, naturalistic approach that uh, we're part of, but not all of. And so let's find our friends and ally with them because so uh, they can help us get the message out and, Helps. Steve is fantastic. I get goosebumps every time I talk to him. Thank you so much for the interview really quick. Um, it was just fantastic talking with you, man. So 
I'm not a fan of these synthesized lists of like your top 20s and such, but occasionally they're put together in very good ways. Um, now, when you have a canonical work, something that been, has been curated and been shown to be pinnacle in the research and the development of some sort of line of thinking, now that's what I'm talking about. Now, this original email that I referenced on the listserv, um, it was from Steve and it was a curated list by David Sloan Wilson on some just top key books when you're talking about evolution science. So that is linked down below, 20 resources, all fantastic resources. I've read some of them and I'm gonna dive into these heavily throughout the beginning of next year and the end of this year. So if anyone wants to kind of share that journey with me, maybe we can do a little book club or something, let me know down below. All right, so I have an Amazon affiliate link included in this uh, description to just go around, look for it, check it out. As with most great things, the editors are David Sloan Wilson and Steve Hayes, but there is a whole list of amazing authors that contributed to this, so thank you to each of you. Now, I'm also including a link down below to the Act for Behavior Analyst Bootcamp. These things are fantastic. I've attended one in 2013 before this for Behavior Analyst uh, designation. I will be attending again in March when it comes back. Let me know what you think down below. Let's continue the discussion, and that's your Daily B. We got you, buddy. We got you. We got you. How'd you guys get this the number one book in behavioral psychology before it actually hit show? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've just been.